I invite you to take your Bibles and follow along with me as I read Hebrews 13, verses 1 through 6. And if you don't have a Bible today or forgot yours at home and you want to follow along, there's one in the pew pocket. And you can turn to page 1,432. Hebrews 13, verses 1 through 6. Let love of the brother continue. Do not neglect to show hospitalities to strangers. For by this, some have entertained angels without knowing it. Remember the prisoners as though in prison with them, and those who are ill-treated, since you yourselves are also in the body. Let marriage be held in honor among all, And let the marriage bed be undefiled. For fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. Let your character be free from the love of money, being content with what you have. For he himself has said, I will never desert you, nor will I ever forsake you. So that we confidently say, The Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What shall man do to me? Father, as we move into this text now, I ask for your help. The power of this promise, I will never desert you, nor will I ever forsake you. I'll be your helper, and you can confidently be fearless. The power of that promise, if it were to grip us and if we were to believe it, if it were to sink down to the bottom of our being and govern all our emotional life, would revolutionize us into a most remarkable people who love each other, who love strangers, who love prisoners, who love the ill-treated, who keep ourselves sexually pure and who are free from the love of money. Oh, what a people we would be if we believe this promise. So I ask, Father, that you would come and grant faith to us. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So now, Lord, as I attempt to un fold the word of God, would you answer that great promise and beget faith? In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Last week I made the case that Hebrews is like a land that has broad valleys of doctrinal foundation and motivation and growing up or sticking up out of those valleys are peaks of practical exhortation, love, holiness, peace, righteousness, run the race, stand strong, hold fast, and that the relationship between those two is that the peaks building your life on a hill so that men may see your good deeds and give glory to your Father in heaven are founded on those valleys of doctrinal, God-exalting motivation and foundation which are issuing out into promises usually. So promises and all the theological foundation of promises like the death of Jesus for sinners like us so that God can give promises to us and not be unjust or naive. That theological foundation in the cross and the resurrection and those promises that make the broad valleys of this book are the rising up of the peaks of exhortation. You shouldn't get it reversed. So we need to know these valleys of doctrine and promise, and we need then to let our lives shine 
with obedience to texts like verses 1 through 5 that Brad just read. Now let's notice the connection between valley and peak here in verses 5 and 6, just as an illustration. Let your character be free from the love of money, being content with what you have. Now that's a peak. That's a peak. That's a command. That's an exhortation. That's one of these peaks from last week. If you do that, if you're that way, you'll be so odd, you'll stick out up in this world. Because believe me, this world loves money and is not content with what they have. What did Jesus say in Matthew 6? All the nations seek these things. Don't be like them. Seek the kingdom and let God add what he wills. So we have a peak here in verse 5, the first half of the verse. And now comes a valley of motivation and foundation. For he himself has said, I will never desert you, nor will I ever forsake you. So that we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid what can man do to me. Now, if you see the connection there between the first half of verse 5 and the rest of those two verses, and you understand the logic here, you will get the book of Hebrews in its basic structure. We are being called to be a radically countercultural people who have values out of sync with the world, not loving money, being content with God and the life He designs for us. And that is based not on any kind of human ingenuity that you can figure out how you're going to pay your bills, but that God has promised, I will not fail to be there to help you. Do you believe it is the issue. And if you believe it, bondage to money will die. That's, that's this verse. It's a faith issue. These practical issues of loving each other, loving strangers, going to the prisons, dealing with the ill-treated, keeping your marriage vows, not committing fornication if you're unmarried, not loving money. Verses 1 through 5 are all rooted in this promise. Do you believe this? That He will be there for you irrevocably as a helper, a divine, omnipotent, all-wise, all-loving helper. And if you believe it, it'll change your life. It'll change your life, as this verse describes that changed life. If God is really there for me, He will be the decisive shaper of my future and not Man, what can man do to me? Now, get realistic, right? What can man do to me? Sue me? Evict me? Steal from me? Lie about me? Kill me? That's all. And I'm not importing anything into this verse to give the writer a hard time. Back up two verses. Tell me what happens in verse 3. Prison. Ill treatment. That's what man can do to you. He's not stupid. He just wrote that. He's talking about Christians there. He knows what happened in chapter 10, verse 34. In the early days, there was a severe persecution. Some of them were in jail and you went to visit them and they plundered your property and you rejoiced because you had a better possession in heaven. This writer knows what man can do to you. So what in the world does he mean in verse 6? 
when he says, because God will never fail me and God will never leave me, therefore I can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? What's he mean? Three things. Number one, he means man can do nothing to separate me from the love of God, from the loving helpfulness of God. It's exactly the same point, as you all know, from Romans as Romans 8, 35 to the end of the chapter, right? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword. As it is written, we are counted as sheep to be slaughtered. We are being killed all day long. No! Just big no! In all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. In all these things... Through him who loved us, for I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. That's the first meaning of what can man do to me. Of course he can kill me. Don't fear those who can kill the body and after that have nothing more they can do. Fear him who can cast both soul and body into hell. Fear not, you can only be killed. I preached a sermon 15 years ago with that title. One of my favorite sermons. (laughs) Fear not, Luke 12, 4. Fear not, you can only be killed. And when you realize, this is one of the things that hit me in St. Louis, talking to these people who had their stories of absolutely incredible suffering. When you realize what James says, that life is a vapor, how long can you make a vapor last on a winter morning? A real cold winter morning. Three seconds max? That's life. And if man can only mess you up for that, and God has the rest of it, then this text starts to make sense. That's the first meaning. The the second meaning is man can do nothing that God does not design for our holiness and peace. That's just two weeks ago. The sermon on chapter 12, verses 4 to 11 The disciplines of God. Man can do nothing that God does not design for our holiness and peace. Man may think he's messing up your life. But God is turning it for your peaceful righteousness. And the third meaning is man cannot do anything to us that by faith does not lead to everlasting joy with God. So, the way Hebrews says you should break the bondage of love of money, here in verses 5 and 6, is that you should believe that God loves you so much that he has committed himself so irrevocably to be there for you, to help you. He, He makes no promise that you'll get rich, and he makes no promise that you'll have no financial stress. Those words, nakedness and famine, in Romans 8, are ominous Are they not? And I believe somewhere down the line we have a fighter verse coming from Philippians 4. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. And the context is I can abound and I can lack. I used to ask students at Bethel just try to teach contextual interpretation I would just give them this verse. They all memorized it. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. I said, like what? Give me a few examples. Witness and have enough food. And I'd say, anybody want to say starve? 
I can starve through him who strengthens me. You say, oh, no, no. Well, that's what the text says. Famine, nakedness, nothing will separate us from the love of God in Christ. I can do all things. I can die through him who strengthens me. Now, there's nothing about small groups in this passage. I admit that. This is a small group focus. But this is... This is all about the way small groups do their ministry. This is all about the dynamic. I'm just going to tell you this. This is the way I want small groups to run. I want them to be small groups in the power of the promises of God. That leads people to love one another. Show hospitality to strangers. Visit people in prison and in the hospital. Keep their marriage vows. Be chaste as a single person and be free from the love of money. That's what small groups are all about, in my judgment. And the way small groups work is by getting in each other's lives and telling each other, He'll never leave you. Come on. Come on back. Don't run from this God His promises are sweet. His provision is sufficient. Do not forsake Him. This is all about small groups here. It's all about small groups. Trusting the promises of God is the key to being liberated from selfishness so that you don't want people into your house because you don't keep a need enough house and I don't want the small group here because they have such a nice house and we have such a plain house and I'm not a good housekeeper anyway and so I don't want to have them over let alone strangers who knows what strangers might bring you know they might be angels the text says those kinds of fears are real Most of us are not worrying all day long about martyrdom in America, but we worry about our clothes, our weight, our housekeeping, our accents and our hair falling out, those kinds of things we think about. And this text is all about that. It's all about that. I will be there to help you. Would you get your resting off of money and off of self? On to me and let me work for you in these practical, nitty-gritty things like whether you can handle a stranger in your house or whether you can go to a prison or whether you can help a wounded, ill-treated Christian and have some words for them. Now, if you doubt that the writer here has small groups in mind, let me just take you back to two texts. Maybe we'll just look at one of them. Go back with me to chapter 3, verses... Well, let's skip 3 and go to chapter... Oh, let's not skip it. Chapter 3, verses 12 and 13. Take care, brethren, lest there should be in any of you an unbelieving heart. Now, that means a heart that doesn't trust Hebrews 13, 6. Five and six. A heart that here's the promise, I'll never leave you, I'll never forsake you, I'll be there to help you, you don't have to be afraid, and doesn't believe it. And therefore gets real anxious about money and real anxious about having strangers over and real anxious and defeated about sex. So this text says Take care lest there be in any of you that kind of unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. But here's the remedy. Here is the remedy. Not John Piper's remedy. The Bible's remedy. But encourage one another. Not just go to church on Sunday. Encourage one another day after day as long as it is called today lest any one of you be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Money. Sex, selfishness, fear, harder and harder and harder until there is no more faith in any promise left. If you ask, how shall we then not succumb to that hardness and unbelief? The answer is small groups. 
We're not real nitty, we're not real sticky at Bethlehem about their shape, their frequency, their size, their curriculum. There's a huge latitude compared to the way some churches do it because we don't think we could make you do it the way we want it done anyway. And so what we want is principles to flesh themselves out in these small groups that are biblical as you see them working in the kinds of dynamics you have in your life. Yes to the promise of God. By the promises of God, Hebrews 3, 13, 5 and 6, we fight and triumph over the love of money. Yes. Standing on the promises I shall not fail Though the howling storms of doubt And fear assail By the living word of God I shall prevail Standing on the promises of God But those howling storms sometimes knock you off the promises of God. That's the issue here. If the Bible presented the image of heroic individuals isolated with their Bibles, standing on promises and venturing into the world triumphant over all sin, we wouldn't have small groups. In fact, we wouldn't have church. That's not what the Bible pictures. The Bible pictures Christians falling down, getting up, falling down, getting up, stumbling all over the place, knock, getting knocked off the promises here and knocked off the promises there and starting to forget them here and, and doubting them there and fearing here. And, and the Bible's remedy to that kind of sin and imperfection in all of us is not just back to the Bible. And I wouldn't minimize that. I'm a Bible man through and through. My job is the Bible. I love the Bible. There are two keys. Two keys, not just one key. One key is the big key called the Bible promise. Remember, remember uh, Christian in, in the dungeon? He says, how can I get out of here? He's all discouraged in Pilgrim's Progress. And Hopeful says, you have a key. Take out the key called promise and unlock the dungeon of despair and walk out. But hopeful said that to Christian. That's a small group. <laughs> Two makes a small group. There's no doubt that hopeful's walking beside Christian in Pilgrim's Progress. The other text that I'm going to skip over is Hebrews 10, 23 to 25, because there it's just small groups again, encouraging each other. But the way I want to move things toward an end is to, is to flesh out the way this works for you a little bit. Let me just drive it home again from verse 5 and 6 and the way it relates to the preceding. There's a promise here. And the promise is... I will never desert you. If you're my child, if you have put your faith in me and you have been born of God and you are among my elect, I will never, ever forsake you. Nothing can separate you from me. And therefore you can confidently say, I get help every minute of the day from Almighty God. And I won't fear. That's the promise. And then you back up because the promise begins with the word for in the middle of verse 5. And it becomes the ground of being free from the love of money. Not cheating on your spouse. Staying chaste as a single person. Loving strangers and being hospitable and opening your house up even if you have to take the broom and go at the corners of your ceiling just before they come.
as well as loving one another. Now, let me give you some illustrations of how I think this would work. Two illustrations. They could, you could do it with every one of these commands. I'll just do it with two of them. Suppose you have a small group now. Say it's 8, 10, 12, 13 people or whatever. And one of the women in the group gets very sick and has to go in the hospital for a few weeks. And the group meets to pray and they remember their uh, sister. And while they're praying and meditating, suppose it's tonight, although the leaders are going to hopefully all be here tonight. Um, somebody remembers chapter 3, I mean chapter 13 here, verse 3, second half of the verse. Since you yourselves are also in the body... A little interesting motivation for visiting prisoners and ill-treated. Since you yourselves are also in the body. What does that mean? Since you yourselves are also in the body. That means use your imagination. If you can imagine what it would feel like to have a, a respirator in your nose or some pipe down your throat gagging and no nurse understands the problem. If you can imagine that, then do the golden rule here. And just as you would have people do unto you, do unto them. You've got a body so that you can empathize with people in the body. That's why you have a body according to this verse. You've got a body so that you can empathize with suffering people. So, somebody thinks of that in the small group and says, you know, I can remember what it was like when I was in the hospital. And um, the way it was for me is that I appreciated more frequent short visits than less frequent long visits. So, why don't we do this as a small group? Why don't we uh, divide it up and one of us go to the hospital every day, just briefly, so that every day, instead of just once a week she will have some encouragement from our small group. And everybody says, oh, good, good idea, except one person. This person kind of sitting off the end of the couch, very quiet, kind of looking down. And everybody else is getting excited about this. And just before they're about to pray and kind of draw things to a close, that person says, "Um, I have never been to a hospital in my life and this sounds real threatening to me I wouldn't know what to say I don't even know if you can walk in I don't know where to park I don't know if you have to get a pass I don't know if you have to wait until the door opens I don't know you guys talk like this is easy I don't have a clue what what you want me to do on my day Now, at that point, uh, verse 3b comes into play again, and somebody says, I know exactly how you feel. I remember two years ago, the first time I ever visited my grandpapa in the, in the hospital. It was, it was eerie, and I had never been, and, and then that person walks them through, parking lot, information desk, hallway, knock, Room, curtains, bed two, how to handle bed one. What do you do? And then they say, I wouldn't know what to say. I mean, I'm not even good dealing with healthy people, and she's really sick. I wouldn't know what to say. You want me to go be a bearer of encouragement? And then somebody else says in the small group, You know, when I was in the hospital, um, two people came to visit me. And both of them stayed probably five minutes. And and they shared with me a verse from their devotions in the morning that meant a lot to them. And they thought it might help me. They read it to me. And then they prayed with me and said they were thinking about me. 
and they left, and it made all the difference. And Pastor John has said that it's far more effective to to deal right off your front burner of of your communion with God than to pull out a hospital text. Here's some hospital texts. Which hospital text shall I use? Far better to say this morning I was praying and my heart was helped by uh, in returning and rest will be your salvation and in quietness and peace will be your strength. That helped me this morning. So I just thought maybe you would enjoy that. And then you pray that they would be helped and you leave. And then one more person says in the small group, you know, this really comes down to a a faith issue for all of us, doesn't it? Because we all feel this way. And then he quotes Hebrews 13, 5. I will never desert you. I will never forsake you. We can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. What can man do to me? And he looks right in the eye of this timid person and says, he'll be with you in the elevator. And he'll be with you as you walk down the hall with funny smells. And he'll be with you as you knock on the door. And he'll be with you as you walk up to the bedside. And whatever you encounter, if she's asleep or if she's vomiting or if they're all around her pushing on her chest he'll help you you'll know what to do so let's trust him can we trust him and they all rally around and they pray and they trust him that's the way I see small groups working here's one more illustration and then we'll we'll close suppose there's a small group And it's men and women, and and this group has the habit, I think it's a good habit, of part of their time is is breaking out. Men on women separate, talk a little bit about things that would be easier to talk about separate, perhaps. And one guy, single guy, says it's a mixed group, some single, some married, and he says, "How How do you guys fight sexual temptation? I'm single, and this society and where I work, The stimulations to think about sexual things are virtually everywhere. I want to be pure. I want to be chaste. I want to have a virgin, chaste body to offer to a young woman that I hope the Lord will give me someday. I want that. And it's really hard. And they start talking with one another and and, uh, older ones and younger ones share various things vigilant strategies they use to combat sexual temptation and fantasies of various kinds. And then one of the more mature men says, you know, uh, one of the things, and I don't claim to be perfect, but one of the things that has meant a lot to me is the promise of God in Hebrews 13, 5. Jesus said, I will never forsake you and never desert you. And then he pauses a long time. Seems to get a little choked up. And he says, what that text means to me is that Jesus would be standing beside the bed in which I commit adultery. And Jesus is standing beside me with his hand on my shoulder as I download things from the internet. And I came to see that if I love him, I can't do that to him. I can't in his very presence, before his very eyes, never leaving me, never forsaking me, I cannot do that which he died to deliver me from. And then they prayed, and this young man had some new weapons in his artillery.